Japan plans to conclude a bilateral agreement with Belarus to share information on nuclear accidents. Belarus suffered from the fallout of the Chernobyl disaster in Ukraine in 1986. The nuclear power plant was located just 10 kilometers from its border. The Japanese government hopes to use the information to deal with the current situation at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. The bilateral deal is expected to include exchanges of detailed data on health problems and soil contamination caused by the spread of radioactive substances. It will allow for mutual visits by nuclear experts to survey the impact of the two accidents. Japan also began negotiations with Ukraine last month on a similar agreement. Meanwhile, North Korea's nuclear envoy has met his Chinese counterpart. Kim Gae-gwan is thought to have reported the results of the nuclear talks with the United States and sought China's support. Kim met Wu Dawei, who chairs the six-party talks in Beijing on Saturday. He's believed to have asked for China's support of his country's position that the U.S. resume food aid and improve ties with the North in order to resolve the nuclear issue. North Korea is apparently seeking the backing of its traditional ally in order to counter the alliance among the U.S., Japan, and South Korea. Foreign experts have told a Japanese government panel that its final report on the Fukushima nuclear accident should include lessons learned and proposals for ensuring safety. Five foreign nuclear experts provided recommendations at the conclusion of a two-day conference in Tokyo on Saturday. The meeting was sponsored by a Japanese panel of experts in various fields charged with investigating the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi plant last March. There must be technical investigation, but I think that what people are mainly expecting from the report are recommendations, recommendations to improve the situation. Former chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Richard Meserve, said the accident led to a loss of public trust in the government and power companies. Well, I think an element, a very important element of what the regulator must do is to assure openness in its activities. The foreign experts also proposed that the Japanese government panel should try to identify the current status of the crippled reactors through computer simulations in order to ease public fears. We received a lot of recommendations. One is the idea of what is improbable is always possible. We must take suitable safety precautions. Hatamura added that the panel will compile their final report by late July, taking the foreign experts' opinions into account. Homeowners and residents in northeastern Japan can now receive information about how to clean up properties contaminated by radiation. Japan's Environment Ministry and Fukushima Prefecture began offering the information in Fukushima City on Saturday. Officials explained the steps needed to be taken to decontaminate property and offered advice. On display were radiation counters and high-pressure water sprays that can remove radioactive substances from the roofs and walls of houses. I've never seen people trying to remove radioactive substances from houses. I'd like to know more about how to decontaminate my property. Almost a year after the accident, the situation at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is still serious. This week, journalists were allowed inside the plant since the facility has been in a state of cold shutdown. Our reporter Hidehiro Hanada was there. And for today's Nuclear Watch, he's here to tell us his observations. And we're going to speak in Japanese, but we'll pro provide you with simultaneous interpretation. What was the purpose of the media tour inside Fukushima Daiichi this time? The second time since November last year that reporters were allowed into the accident site. But it's the first time since the government of Japan declared a state of cold shutdown. The tour was conducted to happen at the same time as a statutory inspection of the nuclear power facilities by the government. Let's see the footage showing us inside the plant. Journalists were given a one-hour bus tour of the plant. 
including the Disaster Task Force facility. The bus drove on a road parallel to the coastline. On the right are the turbine buildings for reactors 1 to 4. The radiation level near the number 2 building was 300 microsieverts per hour. Then it rose to 1500 microsieverts near the number 3 building. Here, reporters were allowed to get off the bus. I'm standing on a hill about 300 meters south of the number 4 reactor building. The radiation level here is 50 microsieverts per hour. Workers in the plant are exposed to higher levels of radiation. Some workers were clearing debris on the roof of the number 4 reactor building that was damaged. The work is to prepare for the removal of spent fuel from the storage pool, which will start next year. About 3,000 people work in the plant every day. Some have had to stop working because they had exceeded the radiation safety limit. The footage shows that the situation in the plant remains serious. The radiation level is still high in many places, and work to remove debris continues. What else did you see? I felt rather apprehensive seeing the hastily built facilities. The water pumps for cooling the reactors were placed on high ground to protect against tsunamis, but they were placed on the back of a truck, parked outside. Since the state of cold shutdown was announced two months ago, there have been 43 water leakages, including from these pumps. One of the reasons for the leakages is freezing. TEPCO has been covering the pumps with sheets and wrapping insulation around the plumbing. Last December, radiation contaminated water leaked into the ocean from a water treatment facility. Sandbags were piled around this facility, giving the impression that it was very much a band-aid measure. Maintaining and managing these facilities is the great challenge to keeping the reactors cooled and preventing leakages of contaminated water. I saw many workers in the plant. What are their working conditions? I saw that it was a very tough work site where workers are being exposed to radiation, which is invisible. I entered the site wearing protective gear and a full face mask. Although it was winter, it was hard to breathe, and after more than an hour dressed like that, I was sweating. Four workers have died so far of heart attacks and acute leukemia. TEPCO says that there is no correlation between the deaths and radiation exposure. But experts say that the work involves radiation, which is invisible, and radioactive substances, making stress and anxiety levels very high. The work to decommission the reactor is to continue for at least 40 years. Finding enough workers and managing their health, including their psychological care, is indeed a challenge. That was Hidehiro Hanada for this week's Nuclear Watch. More than 60,000 households were forced to evacuate after the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. They eventually received claim forms from the pit plant's operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, but half of them have sent the forms back. Now, nearly a year since the accident, the compensation process is being criticized as being ineffective or too slow. Today's Nuclear Watch focuses on compensation for victims. First, we hear of one family who is not happy with the compensation they received. Kazushige Yamada and his family were forced to flee their home soon after the nuclear accident last March. Yamada's home is 10 kilometers from the disabled plant. Before the accident, he spent nearly $400,000 renovating the building. Now, he can't even visit his home without permission from authorities. I love my house, but I'll have to abandon it and move somewhere else soon if I can't cultivate my fields because of radiation. Yamada's family received about $44,000 in compensation from TEPCO. 
but TEPCO turned down his request for compensation for his house and land. TEPCO's compensation policy is so cold-hearted. I hate it. Joining us in the studio is NHK World's Kimitoshi Hirasan. He's been covering compensation issue. He will speak in Japanese with simultaneous interpretation. Why doesn't TEPCO cover land and buildings in its compensation policy? TEPCO says it's because the Japanese government will review the existing evacuation areas one year after the accident. The government is planning to regroup the current evacuation areas according to their levels of radiation into three categories, like the area where residents will be able to return in the near future, or the area where they may not be able to return for a long time. The value of real estate will depend on where they are located. So TEPCO is waiting for the outcome of the uh, government review and says it will come up with a specific standard in April thus if at earliest. I imagine everyone who had to flee their homes hoped to receive compensation soon so they can get on with their lives. The evacuees need a sizable sum of money to rebuild their lives amid uncertainty. It's quite natural that they demand early compensation for lost housing and land. To meet their needs, the government has set up a new organization, the Center for Settling Disputes over Compensation for Nuclear Accidents. The lawyers and judges listen to the claims of both victims and TEPCO and show a settlement plan to both parties from the third party's point of view so that victims can get compensation quickly. The center has already received 800 applications for mediation since last September and the number is increasing. But such mediation has no precedence and is time consuming. There's only four cases so far uh, where settlements have been reached. Initially, TEPCO said it will respect the center's settlement plan, but when the compensation plan for an individual home was shown for the first time last month, it rejected the plan partially. So the process needs to be faster and more effective. Are there any other complaints about TEPCO's compensation policy? Some people decide not to claim damages because if they start new jobs, they get less compensation. Teruo Sebekawa was running a restaurant at Namiemachi, which is now the no entry zone. He resumed business last July in Nihonmatsu City, where he's taking shelter. He wants to get compensation for lost profits, but he was surprised when Tepco told him that the profit he earned with resumed business will be subtracted from the total amount of compensation. This makes sense legally, but he cannot understand why he gets less compensation if he works more. So he is still hesitant about applying for compensation. I think the government wants us to stand on our own feet as soon as possible, but Tepco's compensation policy is a complete contradiction. The victims were deprived of means of living by the nuclear accidents. But some of them decided not to resume their business soon after learning that they would get less compensation if they find new source of income. Experts say TEPCO should not stick to the conventional way of payments in order not to discourage victims. I think victims may lose their hope and drive for the future if rebuilding their lives takes too long. That's right. TEPCO should try to understand the situation surrounding the victims and pay out compensation quickly so that they can get rid of fears and lead a normal life again. The government should also come up with more support programs that make it easy uh, for the victims to find new homes and jobs.